Good morning. Uh, thank you, Bob, for that too kind introduction. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for coming this morning. I'm very pleased to be here. <laughs> Making it big is the sixth in a series of talks I've done on starting, uh, running, and hopefully succeeding with a development company. in any of these specific topics, you might take a look at them. Or, you know, as Bob mentioned, steal a copy of Making It in Real Estate. The book, by the way, is intended to be a primer, more of a, just an outline of good general business principles or real estate principles. It's not intended to be exhaustive. Those people who like it, as some do, say they like it because it's short, it's brief. And Speaking of brief, I'm going to give you a brief history of my background to give you some context. My partners and I started 37 years ago developing neighborhood shopping centers, small centers, 50 to 100,000 square feet, anchored by supermarkets and drugstores. Over those 37 years, we've done about 80 deals, most of them retail. And because we gave up uh, financial partners about 20 years ago, we historically, we've sold two out of three properties. Why do we do that? We do that in order to, to have our own capital for our next project. Despite its challenges, just as an aside, we continue uh, developing retail. We have three projects under construction right now. One, a kind of a classic small neighborhood center. Two, um, small, uh, relatively, they're kind of the, the tail on the pig of enormous mixed-use projects, and we're buying a fourth center. The trick right now with uh, retail, of course, is the internet, and I might come back to that. We're also investing in small-scale uh, residential and office in Silicon Valley. Now, I'm going to apologize to those of you who aren't sports fans, because in order to make a few basic points that are often overlooked in real estate, I am going to rely on baseball. The top level of professional baseball is spread over four separate divisions, single A ball, double, triple, and of course the big leagues. You all know that the players at one level are better than the levels below. What you may not know, this about professional pitchers, They all throw the ball. Doesn't matter what division they're in, they all throw the ball 90 miles an hour. A scout won't look at a pitcher who can't throw the ball 90 miles an hour. What's the difference? The difference between a rookie in single A ball and a Cy Young winner is what? It's control. It's keeping the ball over the strike zone, or more accurately for you true baseball fans, on the corners of the strike zone. Now, you may be just as smart as a major league developer. You may be able to throw at 90 miles an hour in real estate, but you need to have control. You need to know the parameters of your strike zone. In short, you need to know where to develop. Our strike zone, it's pretty simple. It's where growth meets supply constraint. Your target city, where you want to develop, needs to have current growth and long-term prospects for solid growth. I would caution you against mineral-based growth, uh, oil booms, gold rushes. Mineral growth always has a way of playing out. You've all seen ghost towns across the country. Growth that you can rely on is the usual suspects. Tech, medicine, finance, universities, even aerospace. Now something new has come up. Just as when we look at a shopping center today, we have to think about what is the impact of the internet on a shopping center? How many of those tenants are possibly going to be put out of business by the internet? I think it's time to consider climate. 
if you're starting out, if you're 30, 30 years old and you want to be developing for the next 40 years, I think you might consider climate and where you're going to develop. This isn't a new thing. The Anasazi Indians, the famous ancient Pueblo Indians, had an amazing society not too far away from Phoenix on the Arizona border. Went from the 12th century BC until 1275 AD. What happened to them? An extended drought, an extended heat wave. Well, folks, today in Phoenix, anybody here from Phoenix? Good, sorry. I'm <laughs> today in Phoenix, I, you can fry huevos rancheros on the pavement. It's 106 degrees is the average summer temperature. 106 degrees, folks, there are plenty of seats in front. The question is, how much hotter does it have to get before a, a town like Phoenix becomes unbearable? Time Magazine had a, an article just last week about a city, I believe it was in Pakistan, where it is unbearable. It's north of 115 degrees. And to belabor this climate point, I would also wonder whether it's a good idea to develop in coastal Florida. Houston is booming right now, but Houston and the whole Mississippi Valley are suffering from what? They're suffering from catastrophic floods. How often does that happen before people say, gee, I don't want to be there anymore? At one point, I cannot stress enough, it is very hard, very hard to make money in cities without growth, in cities that, <sighs> cities that are losing population, it's almost impossible. St. Louis, Missouri is down 60% from its peak population. So is Youngstown, Ohio. That list goes on and on. You can Google something that says cities that Americans are leaving. The list is a mile long. It will break your heart to read it. I su suggest to you that it would probably break your wallet to develop there. Last week, the Wall Street Journal, I love the Wall Street Journal, but it doesn't always get it exactly right on real estate. The Wall Street Journal ran an article about millennials fleeing big cities, fleeing the, the coast and moving to Denver, moving to Boise, the usual places, uh, and talking about the growth in those areas. The millennials, what are they fleeing? They're fleeing congestion and traffic. What are they rushing toward? Housing affordability. It's great, those cities are booming right now, but what do those cities lack? Denver, Boise, they lack supply constraint. They don't have the physical borders, the mountains to one side, rivers to the other, an ocean, and at least so far, they don't have uh, the political challenges. So, cons oops. Supply constraint. Without development constraints, growth can turn out to be essentially no growth. I'm gonna tell you a story. In 1981, I was 29 years old. We bought our first project that was over a million dollars and I was so proud of it. It was a, a couple of buildings in Sacramento, warehouses. Sacramento then uh, and now has an ocean of land around it. Well, it turned out that the guy we bought from owned most of that ocean of land. His name was Buzz Oates. He was a, an industrial developer, and as it, in addition, I think he probably won that land in a poker game, folks, because he, he basically had a zero basis in it. He also owned an industrial construction company, so every time rents moved a penny, he'd build another million square feet of spec space. What happened? Rents never moved. We worked on that deal for 10 years. It, the, our, that project was in ICU, real estate intensive care for 10 years, and we were so lucky. We uncorked the champagne to, when we got our money back out of the deal 10 years later. I mean, we broke even and we thought, oh my God, that's a home run. Why? Because there was no supply constraint in Sacramento. Still very little supply constraint in Sacramento. Where is their growth handcuffed by supply constraint? You know where it is. Manhattan and San Francisco are great examples. Silicon Valley is another great example. Developers there only throw 90 miles an hour. They're no smarter than you or the guys in Youngstown, but they're surrounded by water and supply constraints. If you're lucky enough to be in the sweet spot, if you're lucky enough to be living where young, smart people are migrating, where jobs are plentiful, you stay there. A couple years ago, I gave a talk in a, let's say, faltering Midwestern state, 
and I was asked what my best development advice was. And I couldn't tell the audience the truth. I couldn't tell them, guys, what you really need to do is move. <laughs> I, I just, I looked at him and said, I, John, you can't say that. Uh, there are seats in front if, if you like. But that's what I'm telling you today. If you want to succeed in business, you, you need to go to uh, that location, to your strike zone, supply constraint. Or, or you can have one hell of a commute. Now, once you have picked the right city, and the cities can vary, uh, once you have your, let's call it your emerald city, where you're going to develop, where within that city do you want to develop? God, God himself probably gave this advice to Adam and Eve as he was kicking them out of the Garden of Eden. This is the oldest advice in real estate. Pick the worst property on the best block you can afford. Starting out, uh, you know, if it's boarded up, that's good. If it's boarded up and half burned down, that's better. If it's boarded up, half burned down, and occupied by squatters, that's best. You know, it's the product type. You know, I used a house as an example, but the product type doesn't matter. Uh, this is uh, one size fits all. All product types work off the same playbook. But I think uh, one of the ways to succeed when you're starting out is to limit your risk as much as possible, to have as few risks as possible. And I think the biggest risk in development is vacancy. You build your project, you get it all set, and nobody comes to the party. You don't lease it. I think historically, in most locations, single family residential, is the kindest in that way. It has the lowest vacancy rate. So single family residential, not a bad place to start. But this advice is definitely one size fits all. Just as important as the where to develop is the who. The who, from whom do you buy this worst property? Choose an unmotivated seller. Chase an unmotivated seller and if you're lucky, if you're lucky, you'll waste your time and some of your money on due diligence. If you're not lucky, uh, the way I was not lucky in 1981, you'll actually buy the property, you'll pay too much money, and you'll end up regretting it for the next 10 years. When a broker pitches you a listing, your third question right after price, cap rate, should be why. Why is the seller selling? What's his motivation? And if it's some BS about, oh, the seller wants to kind of right size his portfolio, or the seller is moving from one product type to another, my suggestion is that you run for the door. I wish I had known this. You know, there's an old line, experience is something that you acquire just after you need it. I wish I had, <laughs> I wish I had known this in 1981. But Buzz Oates was an extremely wealthy developer. He had zero motivation to sell to us. But you know, I had to prove that you know, I was a hitter, that I could do a million dollar deal, so I paid way too much money for that property and regretted it ever since. Now, and then for the record, the mistakes that I'm talking about, I've made every one of them myself personally uh, today. The, the mistakes I'm telling you to avoid, I've made them. Instead of going to graduate school in real estate or learning the trade with a fancy development firm, I pretty much learned it on the street, deal by deal, paying a lot of tuition. Anyway, the answer to motivation, this is pretty simple and it's easy to remember because all the right answers to what's the seller's motivation, they all began what? With the letter D. <laughs> Did the seller die? Is she going through a death grip divorce? Do the partners hate each other? Are they in a lawsuit with each other? Or did the seller lose half of of her portfolio due to a flood or a fire. This is true motivation. Folks, this is worth stressing. But yeah, the other thing, is it easy to find a motivated seller in a uh, tightly constrained area selling a, a property on the worst block? No, it's not easy at all. <laughs> Anybody who tells you that getting rich in real estate is easy probably has a show on daytime reality TV. You know, the answer is uh, real estate is just as hard as, as any other industry. It's fraught with risk and it's difficult to succeed. 
but you can do it. Oh, by the way, if I had to choose between supply constraint, between the, the, the sweet spot and a motivated seller, I would take the motivated seller every time. Because despite what I said, if you can buy it cheaply enough, if you can find somebody highly enough motivated, you can probably make money on real estate. There's another old line, there is no bad real estate, just bad pricing that, that you can probably think about remembering. Another question I'm often asked uh, by people starting out in business is when should I start? Uh, plenty of seats, thank you. When should I start? When should I do my first deal? Uh, some of you have talked to me in the past. You know my answer is always now. Do it today. If you're trying to time the market perfectly, if you're trying to wait for the next downturn, you're not going to make an offer until the next solar eclipse. It's really hard to do. And if you're in, sure, it's always better to buy in a downturn. But if you try to time that perfectly, it's just not going to work. If you're in the market all the time, if you're looking for deals all the time, you'll be in the market when the next downturn comes, when there are more deals suddenly available. But you're not going to find those deals by yourself. And unless you're already rich, you're not going to be able to have the equity or be able to finance them. So how do you throw 90 miles an hour? How do you hit the, start, the strike zone? How did you pull this off? You do it with help from your new friends. Brokers, partners, and bankers, in that order. By far, brokers are the most important. We can dispense with a common self-delusion, one that I had. You're not going to find a great deal by yourself. You know, you think you may be able to, but you're just not. You have a day job. You're looking at properties online. You're, you're driving around on weekends <clears throat> trying to find properties. Hell, you may be even quit your job to go find properties, but you're competing against professionals who deal hunt 12 hours a day, who are sitting in offices with 30 other guys doing the same thing. You're not going to find a deal. Rather than waste your time trying to find a deal, find a broker. Find the best broker you can who will take you seriously and become his or her best friend. How do you do that? You know, and if you're 23 and penniless, uh, might be one or two of you like that here. Your best broker may also be 23 and broke, but you've got to start somewhere. So you decide, you found your Emerald City, does whichever works for you, then you decide on a product type. And for this morning, we're going to say it's industrial, just for fun. So what do you do? You go out and find the best industrial broker in your city that, who will take you seriously. You call her. You say, may I come and see you? May I buy you a cup of coffee? And then when you get in front of her, you promise her 100% commission. You don't make the mistake I made of trying to uh, keep half the commission for yourself. Big mistake. And then on top of the full commission, you say, I'll give you 5% of my deal on the back end. And some of you are saying, whoa, 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 John, WTF. You're going to give away more than a full commission? The answer is yes, I would. It's very hard to get a broker, particularly when you're starting out, to, uh, again, plenty of seats in front, guys, if you want to sit down. Uh, very hard to get them to uh, take you seriously. The way to do that is to pay them more money. Yes, thank you. The question was, when I said back end, when you sell it, what I'm talking about is, and I'll, I'll get into the partnership split in a second, but if you, the developer, are taking 30, 40, 50% of the back end, you tell the, the broker, I'm going to give you a percentage of my share just for, for helping me out with this. Obviously, the big brokerage firms frown on this. You, you need to get their approval. Much easier to do with smaller independent brokers. And back to this point I made, don't get a broker's license. There's a big uh, temptation to say, I'm going to get a broker's license. I'm going to go out and find deals, and I'll keep half the commission, and my partners won't care. That's a mistake. While you're out scouring uh, for your next deal with your new best friend, the broker, you also need to be raising money at the same time. If you do find a great deal, 
you're not going to have much time once you have it tied up. You're not going to get a long contingency period, especially if you look like you're 15 years old. That's just that's going to be tough to do. So you need to raise the, find the deal, raise the money on parallel tracks. So what you do is you go to your friends and family, let's say anybody you think who's good for 25,000, just to pick a number, and you pre-sell them on the ideal. You say, I'm going to go out and I'm going to find fixer-upper industrial deals. And I would love you to be my partner, and they're going to be great, and you'll get a 10% return, whatever the number is. And it's pretty easy, because you're not asking for a commitment. You're just asking for a commitment to seriously consider the deal when you find one. Word of caution there, people will, everybody wants to be a player, everybody wants to be a partner, so it's easier to get people in the beginning to say, oh yeah, I'd be very interested. Don't, if you think you've raised half a million dollars that way, be a little bit leery of how much you're going to end up with. I've talked pretty extensively in the past about uh, partnership splits, so I just want to make two points on partners today. For those of you starting out, the typical deal, the typical split between the developer on the one hand and the money on the other, for a ground up involved, uh, let's say somewhat risky deal, it's the money, the equity gets repaid all the equity plus somewhere between a five and 7% return before the profits share. And that profit share is roughly 50-50. And then the other, for those of you trying to raise money, it's easier to raise money if you promise your financial partners that they get all of their money back before you share. And you might take a very small fee up front, but if you say, look, Jack, you're gonna get your money back plus 7% before I see a buck, uh, at least they know that <laughs> your, uh, your mind is in the right place. Now, at the same time you're looking for deals, and you're raising money, you need to start talking to a bank. Uh, what you do there is back to your Emerald City, you find a small local bank, because we're talking pretty much about small deals, a community bank, someone where they, that will actually talk to you. You go to that bank, you make as large a deposit as you can afford to make, you ask to speak with a loan officer, and then you lay out, this is what I'm going to do. I'm looking for deals in the two to, to five million dollar range, there's going to be industrial, they're not going to be much risk, and here are my list of potential partners. All I need from you is a bunch of money. <laughs> what you don't do with a bank, particularly when you're starting out, you don't argue with the bank about uh, guarantees. Banks don't like this, and I don't think, folks, particularly if you're starting out, there's any practical way to get away from giving a guarantee. Rather, I think I would suggest you convince the bank that you're reliable, you're honest, and you're smart. Uh, the way to do that, A, is be reliable, honest, and smart, of course, and then <laughs> have meetings with them, quarterly reports. You want the bank to know that you are competent and you are working hard on it. Things do go wrong in real estate, and if the bank thinks that you're honest and hardworking when things do go wrong, you have a much better chance of the bank working with you rather than taking the property back. Okay, let's bring all these threads together into a hypothetical deal. I picked this one because uh, on the one hand, it's about as ugly as a building can get, but we have any architects in the room? There's one. Architects love that expression, it's got good bones. I think this, but when I looked at that, wow, that's, that's got pretty good bones. So anyway, this hypothetical industrial building, and we're gonna put all these threads together. We're going to say that that hypothetical building is where? In Grand Rapids, Michigan. I've never been there, but I just read it's one of the fastest growing cities in the country. So, strike zone, check. We're gonna pretend that this decrepit building is the worst one in the industrial park. Sweet spot, check. We're gonna pretend that industrial, and that's probably true, has a zero a vacancy factor, so we like that. We don't have that vacancy risk. And we have a highly motivated seller because sadly the seller died, he needs to sell. All right, and then how did you find this old dog? Through your new best friend, the uh, number one industrial broker. Who are your partners? 
you've raised it with your family and friends, and your local community bank is your bank. In other words, you follow that formula, it all went together. This is kind of a happy ending story here. And what did you end up buying? You bought a two and a half million dollar building. Uh, you raised a million dollars in equity. You're going to put 500,000 into capital improvements, into tenant improvements, into paint and petunias, whatever. So it's a, overall, it's a $3 million deal. This split in the equity, 90% to the financial partner, 10% uh, that you would be putting up as a developer, that's very common. Financial partners often want to see a little money in the deal. But notice that you're charging a fee of 50,000, so your net investment in the deal is $50,000. That fee, I don't think financial partners care much. If you say I want a 1% acquisition fee, because look, dude, it's, it's taken me four months to put this thing together. They don't tend to argue about that. And at the end of the day, the money gets a preferred return of 7%, and then there's a 65-35 split. This is, and I mentioned before, a 50-50 split. That was a ground up deal. This is more of a paint and petunias deal. And so the, the less risk, the less work, the split for, to the uh, financial partner tends to get greater. So ha happy ending on this deal for us. We did it for three million, we sold it for four million, and somehow magically I forgot to put in the preferred return, so we simplified this slide. The, the financial partner got a 7% preferred return somewhere else. Million dollar profit, 650,000 to the money, 350,000 to you, plus your 50,000 in fees, that's $400,000. So folks, what I would say, if you could do this, this little deal, once or twice a year for the next 20 years, you'd be in the major leagues. Uh, at, yeah, in fact, you'd make the Hall of Fame. I noticed in the, um, <laughs> after I'd put together the presentation that I had failed to answer a couple of the uh, points that I raised in the uh, talk description. Debt versus equity. When to use debt, when to use equity, how much of, of each. My take is if you go all debt or close to all debt, that's great. <laughs> it's highly leveraged. Uh, some of us, <laughs> In the early 80s, we're using a whole lot of debt, like 100% financing. Uh, <laughs> but that leverages your risk enormously uh, if, to a catastrophic level. Just as a point of reference, the, the Great Recession, 2009, commercial properties dropped nearly 40%, 40% in value across the board, across the country. So, had you financed 70%, 80%, even 65%, and had your loan come due in 2010, 11, even in 12, you, ha you were in a world of hurt. If you go all equity, just the, the other approach, that works. The problem with all equity is there's no risk in all equity. Uh, if, if you talk, let's go back to my example, if you talk to your, your partners into putting up $3 million, they'd say, well, thanks, John, that's great, but uh, you're not taking any risk. We'll, we'll pay you that 1% fee and get out. If there's no risk, there's no reward for the developer. So the answer is you use both debt and equity on every deal. What's the right amount of equity? Again, think about that 40% catast catastrophic amount, or, or rather write down. I think very conservative, very conservative equity is 50%. Aggressive is probably 65 to 70. The sweet spot may be 55, 60%. That's about what we do. We do about 60%. And this question, I think I threw in there. This is a very long discussion. There are guys in this room who have kept their financial partners for their entire career, for 40 years. Guys walking around this convention center who've done brilliantly keeping their financial partners forever. Uh, and then, then, then there are those of us who went that, down that route and decided, no, I'd rather go it alone. It's, that's the one thing I love about business. There's no single right answer. There are a million ways to succeed in business. You can go it alone, and you can go it with partners. 
We chose to go it alone. Uh, so my answer would be, if you asked me, when should I give up my financial partners? I would say as soon as you can. As soon as you do your third or fourth deal and you can say, okay, Jack, here's your two million. I'm gonna take my money and I'm gonna go do my own deals. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're smart enough, and you are, to succeed in the highly difficult, uh, challenging world of real estate, you're also smart enough to know that financial success is not what you are going to be ultimately measured by. Jim Curtis was an enormously successful investor and developer, made millions as one of the most respected guys in the country. But what Jim will be remembered for is not for the money he made, but what he gave back the countless hours he gave back to the ULI over nearly four decades, the millions he gave to charities. I'm gonna to suggest to each of you today, you know, before I turn this over to questions, that you consider giving back not just checks, but your time when you have an opportunity. 90, everyone in this room is far luckier than 99% of the people on the planet, and the way to show gratitude for that great luck is to give something back. And now, I'm open for questions. Um, because we're recording today, it'd be useful. You can shout it out if you want, and I'll repeat it back, but there are mics on either side. Can you please uh, rate the difficulty of very pr various product types? Uh, retail, residential, hotel, so on. So the question was, would I rate, if back to choosing the, the specialty that, it, that you want to work in, the discipline, would I rate the, the difficulty? I would say, and there are people in this room who probably know better, but I would say hotels are probably the trickiest. Uh, and resort hotels are tricky. Going down to a single family residential is probably the easiest. Retail is tricky because uh, retail and hotels are, you need to I think be all in or all out. Uh, they rely a lot on uh, connections, on people in the business. I think industrial is somewhere in the middle. Industrial might be easier than office. So I think I would go single family residential, easiest, industrial, multifamily residential, office, uh, retail, and then um, hotels. Yes, sir. Describe a bit more the um, relationship uh, why you prefer to use about 65% debt um, opposed to mostly equity on your projects? The question was, can I describe why uh, I prefer to use 60% debt rather than all equity? Uh, well, actually, we do often use uh, uh, all equity or very little debt, but right now, uh, let's say properties are trading 5 6% return. Uh, maybe you get a little bit better, 7%, if it's a little bit riskier property. You can finance those properties at 4%. If you finance 60% at 4% and you're getting, uh, let's say, 6% on the balance, you can substantially increase your, your cash yield. That's the reason to do it. Yes, sir. Hi, how are you today? Thank you for your time. Sure. Um, so, I, your book, you talk about deal size, and uh, I just wanted to hear a little bit more about um, deal size and kind of the idea of, you know, the $4 million deal versus the $25 million multifamily, you know, 100 and, 100 and so unit type of deal. How do you look at, at the differences in those two deals in terms of deal size, in terms of risk, and in terms of returns? So the question was deal size, uh, let's say a $4 million deal versus a, a 50. Or, sure, that's fine. So uh, th this goes back to do I want financial partners or not? Uh, what I have found, again, I act as a mentor uh, each year for the last 10 years, and so I have five or six smart young men and women every year who work for, usually they work for large developers, and we'll talk about $100 million deals. And I'll find out that, you know, the development company has an internal partner, uh, and then there's an external partner, and there's often a capital stack. And I have found that a $100 million deal that sells for 120, say, $20 million profit, the principles at the end of the day, after you pay out outside partner, inside partner, and all these splits, they still end up making a couple million dollars. Not that that isn't a lot of money, folks, but 
I have found that for a little deal that you own yourself, back to why I don't have outside partners, you buy a little deal for four million, you put a million into it, and you make that same two or three million dollars that you would on a hundred and twenty million dollar deal without the risk. If you're building a hundred million dollar deal and things go sideways, um, interest rates go the wrong way, construction costs go the wrong way, much more likely to have a loss. That, yes, sir. Hi, Mr. Uh, good morning. So I'm, and this is Vincent. I can, uh, I'm a graduate student from Baruch College. So I want to ask, uh, sir, you a big and maybe stupid and, and simple question. So what do you think the technology will transform our industry? And uh, uh, the second question is, uh, you, you think that we have to keep the re good relationship with the bankers and the brokers and the partners. So what, um, so is, is it any possible that in the future that we can only uh, use technology like create and uh, just have a small studio to help us to uh, with the technology algorithms the robots to um, calculate everything the risks and to we can uh, it's not time consuming and you can keep the the lowest cost uh, I think maybe so do you think though know, is it possible that a robot or algorithms technology just um, combine the uh, three roles, r brokers and bankers and partners, just one, and to help us to um, do the finish, the, the risk, sort of things like that. Thank you, yeah. Wait, I'm not sure, it was your question, will there be a robot that can be your banker, your broker, and... Yeah, I uh, think maybe this and your is a, it's a little bit stupid, yeah, but I'm just really curious to ask you, yeah, thank you for your time, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I am kind of, I'm old school and a bit of a contrarian. I'm not sure that, that tech is, is going, I think ours is a very personal business. You know, I think you hear me stress personal meetings. Uh, I, I don't, I think you've got to get in your car, you've got to go meet people, you've got to drive. I, I, tech has made some inroads, but it, it certainly hasn't. Uh, somebody asked me, and in my role as a, a columnist to look at it, there is a software program that, that is supposed to, eliminate developers, you know, kind of a, a developer in a box software program, and I'm, I'm not sure that's taken over, so I, I don't have a good answer on that one. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Th thank you for asking. Yes, sir. Uh, John, I have a simple question. Do you sign guarantees? <laughs> yeah, so the question is, do I sign guarantees? And that, folks, is one of the biggest lies in ULI. You'll hear almost everybody get up and say, oh, man, I never sign guarantees. Well. Uh, the answer is I do sign guarantees. There, there's a little bit of background. In, in construction, there are two kinds of guarantees. There's a completion guarantee. That is, I hereby promise that I will finish the building. And then there's a repayment guarantee, which is I hereby promise that no matter what happens, I will repay the, the construction loan. Everybody signs completion guarantees. So the guys who say they don't sign guarantees, they're just putting the completion guarantees aside, okay? Uh, it is hard. Do I sign uh, completion? Do I sign repayment guarantees? Yes, but this goes back to our method of doing business. We use our own money, so let's just keep it simple. Let's say it's a ten million dollar deal, and I've put four million into it or five million into it, and I'm borrowing five million. Do I care? Uh, I know I'm not gonna walk away from my five million, so do I care if, if I promise the bank that I'm gonna repay their five million? The answer is no. But if I were going with financial partners and if I had one of those Tower of Babel capital stacks, first loan, second loan, mez piece, inside, outside partners, and so it's like 95% money, I'd care a lot, and there I would try, and I would not sign guarantees. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, my question is, uh, what do you think about doing fee development or consulting to pay the bills um, while working on equity deals? I think that's a great idea. Uh, one of the problems, what I just outlined for you about how to make money, not to charge any fees until you get uh, the deals rolling, the problem with that is a deal at warp speed. You know, the Millennium Falcon <laughs> takes three years from the time you see it, fix it up, lease it, and sell it. So you're not gonna make any money for three years. How did I do it? I, I was a lawyer. I was actually a pretty mediocre lawyer and nobody missed me when, when I stopped practicing law. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but 
I kept practicing law for about five years to, to pay the bills. So if, if you can do fee development, that's great. Uh, if you can do consulting, that's great. You just don't want to get too deep into it that it gets in the way of finding your equity deals. Yes, sir. Um, John, we're, we're homies, actually, because I'm, I'm from the Bay Area as well. Um, one of the, the things that concerns me in, in doing deals is that, you know, we all have, you know, a skill set, discipline that we're good at. Um, and in supply constraint markets, the political process is very difficult. You know, the, the yes. pre-construction entitlement phase. Um, I mean, is, is it better when you, say, come from a legal or, you know, financial reporting background where you know how to structure a deal from a compliance standpoint and all of this stuff? to uh, start with a value add project because it might not be as difficult as a ground up? Great question. So in the, the, the tight supply constrained markets, there are usually political problems. It, you know, it's the, the development challenges, the NIMBYs uh, fighting you. And so the, the question was, and it was excellent, is what about going with a, a, a value add with an existing property? You know, we've been in, in these, these tightly constrained markets for a long time, and, and we have preferred doing re rehabs, uh, a grind, taking an old shopping center and fixing them up, unless the town happens to have a major university in it, like, oh, Palo Alto or Berkeley or, or Santa Cruz. The towns will almost uniformly give you the approvals you need without a lot of, if you say, you've got a broken down shopping center here and we want to build a brand new one, they, they'll give you a, a ticker tape parade in the metal, most towns. Uh, so a good way to, to lower your risk is, is to do uh, re remodels, rehabs. Um, I don't think being a lawyer really helps um, the, the political process of getting deals approved. It may get in the way. Uh, that, that's just that is a long, difficult process, but that's where the money gets made. But it's not something to do when you're starting out because uh, you can get turned down on zoning. Yes, sir. Hi, thanks, John, for the presentation. Uh, sure. Resonated with me, especially being 23 penniless and just starting out. <laughs> uh, I got a broker I want 24, you to meet. So, uh, <laughs> anyway, so my question is, uh, can you describe the range of profit sharing splits between developers and money partners? Sure, good question. So I, I told you that 50-50 is, is kind of like the, the teeter-totter middle point. Uh, that again is for a, essentially a, a full-on development deal, ground up or, or taking a deal uh, and totally renovating it, construction loan, construction guarantees. If I found a deal, uh, wow, th this is a good little building and all I need to do is paint it and lease it up I would expect as a developer to give 80% of the profit to uh, the financial partner. It's not that much work, not that much risk. So I would say 80-20 money to developer on uh, simpler deals, um, all the way down to 50-50. I can't say that I have seen, although I've heard other people, other developers who, who are more persuasive than I am, who've gotten better than 50-50 deals with their money partners, but that has not been the case. Yes, sir? Hi, John. You said you sell two out of three properties that you develop to move the equity forward to your new projects. Yes. How do you identify which projects to sell and which to keep? So the question was, I mentioned we sell two out of three, uh, or hopefully trade when we can. Uh, how, how do we keep the one? Is right back to the, the heart of the talk, supply constraint. If we're developing in Palo Alto, which is extremely difficult uh, to get properties approved, we keep Palo Alto. So we have seven projects in, in Palo Alto. If we're developing in the Valley, now remember I'm a retail developer, so I work with Walmart, I work with Safeway, I, I work with Starbucks. If they say, hey John, we'd like you to uh, find us this location in this small town, um, Weed, we, we, we did it. Not, not the smoking kind, but there, there's a town called Weed in California <laughs> uh, in the middle of nowhere. So we built a market there and we put that bad boy on the market for sale uh, the, the day of the grand opening. So it's essentially, we want to keep our core portfolio in, in, t in highly competition constrained areas. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hey John, thanks. Uh, as a practicing attorney who started a real estate development company and practice on the side to keep going, I. I uh, feel your pain from 
from a while back. Uh, we have had a number of deals where we've had to co-develop, so we split the sponsorship or the GP gets split 50-50. Curious if you've had that experience and how you've viewed jo joint venturing with other developers on a deal. Um, it does make the numbers tighter, uh, and I'm just kind of curious, particularly when they're happy when I sign the guarantee and they don't. But curious on your experience or, or anything you have on co-development deals. Uh, I don't have experience with that. Uh, our, our partners have always been uh, either land partners or financial partners. Um, <clears throat> I have found, though, where we don't maintain control, uh, life gets more difficult. Uh, and so I, I personally would not do that because I'd, I'd like to keep the control. Yes, ma'am. So besides the heat, um, how do you feel about the Phoenix market? <laughs> Uh, well, actually, I'm pretty lazy, so <laughs> uh, so for the almost 40 years, all of our, our development projects have been within a two-hour drive. You know, I, I, I talked about it. We have specialized uh, in retail. We also specialized geographically. I, I think you can do one or you can do both. So I, 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 Phoenix is a lovely town, by the way, but I, I tend to go in the spring. Uh, so I, I don't really have a... My sense is more climactic, like, oh my God, things are just getting too hot or too wet. So, sorry. <laughs> yes, Hi. Um, so my expertise is in financing affordable housing deals, and I do a lot of them, and they're with, you know, the crazy capital stacks you talked about. I keep getting offers for smaller equity deals that would just be, you know, for me and great, but I struggle when I look at the numbers because I'm so used to looking at a different type of development. Is there any one or two resources that you would point me to to help me, um, I guess, get more comfortable with a different uh, different set of numbers? I'm sorry, could you explain that a little more? What's sure. wrong with the numbers that you're looking at? They look really low. And, and <laughs> may, maybe that you know, is just the way it is. I'm in a very hot market, Austin. Land is expensive. Right. Construction costs are really high. But I have pieces of property that I know should work, and I just think I'm doing something wrong. Okay, well, real estate is, is the most local of all businesses, but right now in the Bay Area, very, very smart guys, big time multifamily builders are sitting on their dirt because the numbers don't work. You know, the land prices are too high. Construction costs, I think, are going, the last I checked, they were going up 1% a month. And so there are major yeah. entitled projects right now in Northern California where they're just sitting on them saying, we, we need to wait. Um, and then rents, at least again in Northern California, are st starting to trend down a little bit, uh, the residential rents. So uh, it, the, the numbers are bad. Back to that two deals a, a year over 40 years, I'll just point out that in down markets, we may have bought five properties in a single year, and in up, we, we might go a couple of years it gets a little scary. We, we, we might just say, these numbers don't work. We might go a couple of years without buying anything. Uh, it, it just averages out a couple of years. Yes, sir? Yeah. Um, so what's really wrong with getting a brokerage commission by saving half the commission? So the question is, what's really wrong with, with uh, getting a brokerage commission? What's wrong is that uh, if you tell brokers you say, hey, I'm interested in your property, and they say, great, and you say, I'm acting as a broker, I wanna get half a commission. What's wrong is you'll never see any good deals. <laughs> They'll just cut you out. Uh, what happens in a down market where a seller is desperate, you can, you can buy occasionally, you can pull that off, but the professional brokers do not wanna deal with you. Um, what you're trying to do, again, in, in a competitive market, you're trying to get access the best, straightest, cleanest access to the best deals, and putting yourself in there as a, a broker is, is a mistake, I have found. You know, yeah, maybe you save 50000 on one deal, but in the course of your career, if you keep doing that, you just won't see other good deals. I had a broker's license. I figured this out. I gave it up. No more license. Yes, sir. Would you describe what information or analysis you take with you when you're meeting with your banker or investors? What, what's most important? What might you overlook if you didn't know better? What's convincing? 
rephrase that for me. Give me a little. Uh, sure. Give, like, I mean, give me something to hang on to. Okay. We'll talk about the level of financial analysis, spreadsheets, due diligence. What is it that you normally take along with you to that meeting that you know they're going to need? And if a new uh, beginner didn't know it, they might go without it. What we try to do is, is make our presentations to as simple as possible. You know, it's essentially, like, a, uh, if you can't, you know, there's an expression, if a deal doesn't make sense on the back of a napkin, it doesn't make sense. Uh, you basically, we're, we're just pitching the headline of it. So I want to say, I'm buying this property. Let's let go back to my example. I'm buying this property for two and a half million. The park, everything sells four to five million. All I need to do is put up $500,000 to bring this bad boy up to snuff. So I'm in at three million. And here are the rental rates. You can do all this just like I did on once. You can do it on one page. You know, I, I sell the big picture. And sure, you know, we have the backup stuff. But uh, one thing we don't do, we don't do long-term projections. We only figure out value to the date that the property is uh, fully leased and in service. So we'll say we can pick a valuation, a, a cap rate 12 months out, 18 months. But we don't do IRRs. We don't try to sell. Here's what the future is going to look like in, in 10 years. I don't think that works. Folks, it's 10 o'clock. Uh, I'm happy to answer a few more questions. You've been a great audience. Thank you very much.